Wow, it's amazing to see so many people here. Um, thank you so much. I know some of you um, joined the, the Phil Lisbon main stage earlier today. Thank you for crossing half of the town all the way here to this uh, beautiful venue. Um, also, I mean, while we are doing all this analytics, feel free to just um, look around. This is a very uh, historical uh, venue. Um, heard that it used to be either a, a palace or like a, a church. So this is some, some, some place that's a, a very beautifully designed. Some of you guys were here yesterday for the Falcon meetup as well. So while we are um, enjoying the inherit, like inheritance of history, uh, we are also um, taking a sneak peek of the future um, of uh, data, of blockchain, of Web3 network analytics. So uh, thank you uh, so much for uh, being here. Uh, my name is Sylvan. Um, I work at uh, Starboard, uh, which is a research-focused company uh, with uh, expertise um, in network analytics and also product incubations. So basically, um, our main goal is to uh, use our um, uh, expertise, use our knowledge on uh, the Falcon blockchain to help people understand what's going on, what is the status of the blockchain, and also identify if there are some gaps that could potentially be resolved by some form of network analytics. And we do have some um, fantastic guest speakers here who are working on uh, Falcon network data related products or infrastructures. And then I'm pretty sure that uh, you'll hear lots of wonderful talks from them. Um, and that might inspire for even more projects on network analytics. So uh, I guess uh, without further ado, uh, we will just get started. Um, we, we, we have a very nice program here today. You can always just uh, go to our website. It's also updated in the calendar event if you want to see the, the, the full program. And our uh, first speaker uh, is our very own Ben Hao, uh, who is a data scientist at Starboard, where he supports the company's efforts to contribute to the Falcon ecosystem through network analytics. Uh, previously, he was a, a physicist in academia before working on an ill-fated startup to cool uh, electric vehicles. Uh, that's very fun stories. Uh, he's interested in network analytics and the application of statistical physics to um, complex um, systems. So let's give a round of applause for uh, Starboard's Dr. Ten. Ben Hao Ten. <laughs> So uh, thanks to my boss for giving me a very kind introduction. Uh, Sylvan has already told you uh, what Starboard does. So I'm just going to say that uh, this talk is going to be about how analytics is a foundation to perform uh, governance of the Filecoin network. So I guess most of you uh, don't really need an introduction to the fact that uh, Filecoin is a very vibrant, uh, decentralized data economy. So Basically, since uh, the inception of, of uh, the network, uh, you know, we have been committing deals into, into the, the system at a pretty much an exponential rate, right? So the state of the network today is that um, the network capacity is about 16.5 exabytes. Uh, there are 4,000 uh, service providers and a cumulative uh, 2 million users who have uh, interacted with the system. So, by scale, uh, Filecoin is clearly a very uh, vast, uh, complex system. And it consists of many different stakeholders, right? Uh, you have researchers, developers, token holders, service providers, users. And because it now you have a very vast system, which is you know, decentralized, uh, it's community driven, and it has many different uh, stakeholders. So the question is that, you know, uh, First of all, how do you govern such a sprawling system, number one? But before we answer that question, we have to get into the details of you know, why is governance important and why is governance challenging? So the importance of governance is that you know, for Filecoin to be, to be an ongoing concern long into the future, right? it has to be, number one, it has to generate some value for people in society. And number two, it has to be worth the time and effort that all the individual stakeholders are putting uh, you know, into the ecosystem. But the, the problem is that you know, in this ecosystem, you have 
all kinds of stakeholders, and each of them have different short-term and long-term uh, priorities. So the real challenge here is how do you arrive at a consensus if, let's say, you want to implement an improvement to, to the network, right? Uh, you know, how do you how do you drive uh, the, the the changes to the network in such a way that everybody is happy? And this turns out to be uh, quite a difficult thing as well. So, next question you, you might want to consider is uh, how what is a good approach for governance, right? And here is where you know uh, Starbot has its own uh, proposition, right? So our basic proposition is that uh, we believe that you know, analytics should be the foundation of governance. And hopefully by the end of the talk, I will have demonstrated to you that uh, uh, an analytics is definitely the, 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 the foundation of governance. So what we do is that, because we know that uh, Filecoin generates uh, large volumes of data, right? And it's in basically in an unstructured form. So our, our, what we plan to do is that you know, we plan to, to pass all this data and map them into features that are usable for different stakeholders in, in the ecosystem. And you know, based on these uh, uh, insights that you get, or rather based on these observations, uh, you can then you know, start to create actionable insights, such as you know, recommendations, actions, uh, things that we can do to improve the network. So more concretely, what, what Starbot does is that you know, we generate insights you know, through tr uh, three different paths. So the first major way is that you know, we present information to people in the ecosystem, right? And this information is not just you know, uh, the tables in, in, in the database, right? But it's context sensitive. So you can track the health of the, of the system as it evolves in time through different, uh, different perspectives that you might care about. Uh, secondly, we also contribute by, you know, when people are trying to propose changes to, to the network, right, we contribute scenario modeling and also predictive ana analytics about, you know, uh, what are the possible permutations of things that could happen and, you know, uh, predicting ahead what that proposal might entail for the network in the long run. So our flagship product is the Network Health Dashboard. And I think quite a lot of people in the audience will have seen this uh, website before or will use it <laughs> pretty much uh, daily or at least very regularly. So you can think of this dashboard as you know, a kind of a one-stop shop for you to get contextualized information about the state of the network, right? And basically our dashboard has you know, a few different tabs. Uh, capacity, deals, uh, transactions, and uh, circulating supply. <clears throat> so the, the first major area is in uh, capacity and services, right? So we are trying to answer the questions of, you know, what is the size of the network day by day? Uh, how much new uh, storage is you know, onboarded on a daily basis? And we also do a few other uh, breakdowns, let's say, by the, the size of the sector. Uh, we also cover a lot of uh, service-related metrics, right? So sometimes uh, sectors may have faults or may terminate. So we also track, like, you know, uh, is, are there any trends uh, in terminations and, and, and errors in the system? The uh, second thing that we do is to check uh, adoption, right? So adoption in the sense of, you know, how, how many deals are, are, are committed or the size of the deals are committed uh, to, to the network. And we also do a, a final breakdown, let's say by you know, uh, clients or service providers, right? So this will give you a sense of uh, basically the system sensitivity, right? How, how dependent is the network on uh, X number of miners, let's say. And another thing that might be quite important for people is uh, usage statistics, right? How, because, the, the, the fees that one might pay in, in a network are 
dynamically var uh, varying depending on the state of the network. So the tr base transaction fees, overestimation fees, penalty fees, uh, they all depend explicitly or, or implicitly on the state of the system. So this can be very difficult to gain intuition about. So th this graph is actually very invaluable to have a sense of you know, what, what's happening uh, to the network. In, and especially in relation to, to other, other visualizations. So you will see on the right-hand side of the screen that uh, the minor tip uh, experienced a bit of a, of a spike recently. So we noticed that uh, this comes actually uh, coincide with the fact that around this time, there was a drop in, in uh, network capacity and there was a, a spike in uh, uh, errors and terminations. So it's still not clear to us like why, why it happened, but you know, this can give us some kind of, uh, at least some kind of uh, instinct uh, as to what might, might be causing such uh, uh, unusual spiking. So the last, the, the last area uh, pertains to circulating supply, right? Because they, they, there is a token that is distributed and of course uh, it sits at a very, uh, it sits at a, at a very precarious equilibrium. You can't have too few tokens in, in circulation, but you can't have too many as well. So it's very important actually to track uh, the, the circulating supply uh, in the network. So what we do actually is that we uh, track on a day-by-day day -day basis, right? You know, how much uh, fill is mined, uh, vested, dispersed, and burned. So once you have all these like basic uh, visualizations, right, and you kind of look at them day by day, then you have a pretty good idea of how uh, the network is, is uh, progressing day by day. And you might see something that concerns you and you might want to improve it, right? So if you want to, to kind of table an improvement to the system, uh, there is already an existing process called the Filecoin Improvement Proposal or FIP. So every major change that you, that you want to make has to start with a kind of a draft proposal and you have to refine it. There might be some rounds of discussion and once it's considered mature, it goes to a vote. And there's some you know, pre predetermined uh, logic for, for waiting the vote. And as long as uh, all the major stakeholders have approved it, then the, the FIP is adopted. So I, I want to, to discuss a particular example uh, that might be contentious, but it's also a very good example of you know, network governance in action. So this, uh, this is called a FIP 36, uh, which was, yeah, it was voted on recently. I, I can see some uh, twitching eyebrows, yeah. So the background of this uh, proposal is that uh, People, of course, have been, it always starts with one of our visualizations, right? So people notice that, so although I showed you in, in the first slide that, you know, the sector onboarding has gone exponentially up, uh, the reality is that in the last uh, few months or so, uh, the sector onboarding has been going down. And you can see in the red arrow, there's uh, quite a large spike downwards. So we're not sure why <laughs> there, there was this, uh, you know, large drop. It could be related to, you know, macroeconomic factors, but don't really know. But the, the main concern is that uh, all the sectors have, have an expiry date, right? They're going to expire at some point in the future. So you will have a, a crunch situation some point in the future, right? Where you might have a situation that, uh, you know, the, you don't have enough uh, capacity uh, onboarded. So these observations lead to the authors of the uh, FIP 36, right? They say, well, the, they suggest this uh, change to the network, right? So they say that, well, we want to make sure that, you know, uh, we, they, they want to ensure the long-term vitality of, of the network. So they say, why don't we adjust the durations that the, the, the sectors are, are available? Or we can say, because right now, uh, <coughs> uh, sector duration is not explicitly rewarded. So they want to adjust the quality the quality based on how long the, 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 the sector is meant to be alive. So this of course comes from a place where you are prioritizing the long-term uh, future of, of the network, right? But as I mentioned, you know, there are other stakeholders in, in the ecosystem 
And there are people who also have short-term priorities, right? Basically, money finances. So, of course, uh, service providers express the, the, uh, the opinion that they might have to put up, up uh, increase upfront costs, right? And if everybody, if all the, uh, the service providers are, need extra money, then you know you lead to a situation where uh, you know you might have a crunch in the in the, in the funding situation, right? Everybody's trying to 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 loan uh, uh, or get some credit uh, instruments at the same time. So this introduces a lot of uncertainty. We don't know uh, what are the long-term implications of this uh, well-intentioned change. So once this proposal is put up, right? Here comes a lot of people. I mean, it, it's uh, heated conversations. Uh, Andrew also has some some, uh, <laughs> some opinions. So if you look carefully, I mean, you can go to this website and, and you know look at the detailed discussions. <clears throat> Pretty much all the the major points that are being made, right, all start with some kind of observation of the network, right. And actually, this observation of the network is coming from from you know some kind of uh, base data that is provided by Starboard. So there are some people that are saying, you know, I, I, I would like you to, to vote for this uh, FIP because of X, Y, Z reasons. And then there are other people that say, well, you know, uh, you're, you're not attending to my concerns. And there's also a process of trying to improve the, 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 the proposal. So one way to improve the proposal is to perform scenario modeling, right? So if let's say you have a proposal and you know there are numbers inside the proposal, right? Let's say I, I want to extend the, the sector life by one year. But why must it be one year? It can be two years, three years, right? So the question is, you know, what, what's going to happen to how viable is the proposal if you adjust the, the numbers, right? So they do some kind of parameter studies, scenario modeling, and this gives you an idea of you know, how you might want to tweak the proposal to make it more palatable to, to other people. Another thing that you can do is actually just, you know, predictive analytics, right? So let's say uh, we're going to implement this model as uh, this uh, FIP as it is written. What's the long-term effect? So, you know, because you know all the governing rules that go into calculating rewards, you can do a kind of a forward prediction, uh, you know, what is going to be the expected returns, what, what are going to be, you know, the um, pledges that, that uh, service providers might have to put up. So basically, it, long story short was that FIP 36 wasn't accepted by, by the community, right? But this is a very good example of, you know, uh, there are many, many stakeholders and it's, it's really difficult to do governance, right? But the, the great virtue of network analytics is that it gives you a foundation for all the stakeholders to participate in community governance. And because you have good data, you can carry out you know, good discussions and try to influence each other and therefore as a collective make an informed decision. So with that, I, th I thank you all for your attention and yeah, I look forward to your questions. Uh, I believe I, there was one group who yeah. vetoed the FIP, so uh, wondering if you can sort of um, you know, share more uh, insights into why that group um, you know, was not in favor of the FIP and it seemed like most of the community was in favor of it. Uh, I find it hard to answer this question because I, I'm not very experienced. But I mean, I as I understand it, the main concerns were uh, the service providers are, are worried about the upfront costs and, and financing situation. Uh, they, they see that there is not so much certainty. Maybe Andrew can clarify. I guess the two things. So thank you for putting me in the in the presentation. Uh, um, I guess the two big pushbacks I would always see because we took a while, Picnic took a while to respond to the FIP. We we're just everybody's going back and forth, but we wanted to just at least offer a view, and it was exactly that. It was one that even with a new multiplier that doesn't necessarily apply to real data that that's gonna impact the reward profile of like a, a storage provider that stores data. So we're gonna earn less. And the other one was, which I actually felt was really gonna be solvable, was the lack of being able to lend 
three and a half years in the future. Like I, I just felt like as someone who spent a lot of time in financial services, like Anchorage, Dart, pick your lending group, Palladium, like they will, they will solve that. But that was the other thing, finding collateral for that upfront pledge felt very onerous. So that there was a lot of pushback that way. Hi, sure. thanks. <laughs> um, so I'm Xilin from Client Growth Team at Protocol Labs. Uh, yeah. I have a question about uh, what's your thought about how do we merge like off-chain data and on-chain data and what challenges do you see in um, when, when you do so? Yeah, because I really like the how Starboard, you know, put the network uh, uh, that dashboard. Uh, but I'm also wondering, uh, if possible, can we, for example, add the storage provider name versus the minor ID? And if not, what prevent us to do so? That's a more specific question, yeah. Well, it's obviously a very complicated uh, uh, a problem to answer. Uh, I, I can only say that there are, when, when it's mainly a problem of like uh, infrastructure, right? Because if let's say I think one one thing that we are interested in is you know trying to map uh, miners to, to locations, let's say. So I mean it's possible from from a data engineering point of view. Let's say you have a lookup table and then you can map let's say IP addresses right to to a location. But then you have a question of how reliable is the data, right? So it, it's it's a big problem that is kind of difficult for us to solve on our own. We really need the help of the rest of the ecosystem. So like you mentioned, you wanted to map uh, minus to names, and actually that's also something that we are interested in. And yeah, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a problem that I, I have some like, you know, magic uh, solution to. But I, I do think that uh, some of the talks might give uh, insight into that, especially uh, Jim's talk later. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's Thanks. why we are all here, that's why we're here to yeah. identify the collaboration point. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, according to your question, actually, on early stage of Filecoin, if you see the field fork or field scan back to 2020, you can see the miners ID name in China mostly, but because of, it's not only technical problem, it's also like regulations, many countries, different environment. So yeah, they all removed the, the, the information. You can mask the IP as well. Yeah, that's yeah. true, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you for providing fancy dashboard, uh, Starboard. I have question to your website. Why do you call it ben Starboard Ventures? Maybe question to yeah, you. Yeah, my, my boss would be better positioned. <laughs> uh, so I think, first of all, uh, we just thought that Ventures is a very, really, really cool name and then a really cool domain to have. So it's like- Do it's you like, do VC investment? No, it's, it's just like when we are browsing all the um, domain options. This one really stood like stood up to us. So we thought, oh, at least we'll secure that. <laughs> um, and then um, I think it really goes back to the the Starboard business model and also like the Starboard's vision. Right? So our uh, vision, as some of you might have already secured a Starboard tote bag, right? So uh, we we wrote like empowering Web three data uh, uh, economies with um, uh, like network analytics and product incubation. So meaning that with only the analytics part, right? With only um, identifying some of the problems uh, in the w within our ecosystem and then trying to propose solutions uh, to it. We also want to uh, advocate for initiatives within these ecosystems to actually execute on the product, right? And provide solutions actually uh, in a very pragmatic way. So I think that is where the ventures might come from, right? Uh, I'm not sure if we will turn into like a, like a VC in the future. We could, <laughs> anything is possible. But for now, I think um, uh, because we are all here in this Falcon ecosystem, I think Falcon ecosystem itself is a venture. So in some way, we are all like investing our time, investing our energy and capital to this great venture. So in some way, we're all a venture. <laughs> awesome. Data analytics based community governance and uh, investment business. business. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Um, I have a quick question. Uh, yes. Thank you very much for the, for the talk. So I wanted to ask about like from a governance point of view, how do you optimize for agility? Because I feel like, like scenario modeling and productive an uh, analytics is quite yeah. a manual thing. 
it's like how do you mm. how do you cope with like trying to make decisions fast well that that actually goes to more scientific uh kind of thinking because uh you can do like parameter fitting with uh let's say a markov chain monte carlo so that's where you might need to hire uh, 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 a mathematician or a physicist to to carry out such computation. It, it, it's it's a uh, it's a known thing that uh, you can do such uh, parameter optimizations quickly. But but the thank you and uh, yeah. but the scenario modeling and predictive analytics that's like purely manual work, right? Yes. But you know you want you want to put out because uh, these things are kind of table and and push forward at short time scale, right? So. You, you, you just want a quick insight rather than a very detailed academic style study. Yeah. For sure, thank you. Uh, I think that partly that's why the, the, like the product incubations could come in handy, right? So basically we're trying to abstract some of these analytics into product. So it's actually reusable for like various uh, community governance scenarios so that you don't have to go through, I, I mean, it's like 100% of the work, but you don't have to start from scratch. There are some work that you can um, look into that previous people have done or have established a framework uh, into the thinking. And also in terms of like agility, I think some decisions need to be made quick, but some decision needs to be made diligently. So uh, I think that's also a trade-off that community governance and uh, the entire ecosystem needs to, needs to face. Yeah, hope that answers your question. Uh, we have one more question, and then we need to move to the next uh, talk. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I I come from like the data science background. I yep. I work for Grafana, so I don't know. Yeah. Like I I don't work in the Web three space, but I'm I'm curious to hear that um, uh, scenario modeling in the future. I know yeah. that it increases substantially with the um, uh, with time, so like yeah. you, it's really hard uh, right. to predict something one week ahead, one month ahead. Uh, right. And I'm curious to hear if you uh, could could use uh, sort of an A/B testing uh, release of a main net beta. Uh, I don't know know how costly that would be. <laughs> I'm curious to hear about that because then. Uh, people who are like in the yeah. alpha, you could have some customers opting in to see if this new scenario would actually make sense for them and how that would look for them. So curious to hear about, you know, is that really a possibility in this space? Well, I mean, from a data science perspective, because I, I also have a background in data science, uh, time series prediction is, is definitely risky business. So if you look at the, at the, the notebooks, right? There, there are some you know inbuilt assumptions you know that lead to this graph being made right and to be honest we don't know whether these assumptions are are, are, are solid or not so i think you are, you might be asking a question of like uh, how do you integrate uh, proper time series uh, uh, time series predictions right into into the future or maybe i didn't catch well you. well i was <laughs> curious to hear if if this yeah. is sort of like uh, you could solve this not with uh, you, you you could make predictions uh, yeah. like in the future, but you could also introduce uh, uh, sort of a new release process to see, you know, like um, any, anyone knows that uh, yeah. uh, if you have enough users, you can release to like 2% and see, you know, if this kind of yeah. storage provides, sorry. For <laughs> uh, that becomes a yeah. governance question, right? It's not really a, a, a question for Starboard, it's about, you know, <laughs> you have to put up a fib and say, hey, uh, I want to have oh, an A-B testing platform. That's true. And anybody that's can true. table this. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Uh, mm. uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I think I Out of time. Uh, sorry. Um, thank you uh, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Let's give uh, uh, Dr. Ben Hao Tan a very round of applause.